So um, my personal sharing is obviously Exodus here. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't personally there, obviously, so. Uh, but I think Hossein just put that as a placement because I ignore all of his text messages. It's, it's a game we play. Um, <clears throat> I've, for a long time, wanted to put together the, the story of Moses. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of it. Uh, I really didn't know how long it was until I, I, I ended up putting this together. Uh, it's 21 pages at a 12 font here. And um, so I'm going to try to go through and, and touch on some stuff. But it's amazing. I put together, mashallah, in a, in a chronological um, order, and the verses and all that good stuff. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, I want to start off with Moses and his teacher. And um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Shout out to Rod uh, for giving me his time slot. I'm supposed to do that. So thank you, Rod. Appreciate that. <laughs> Shout out to Rod. He's single. He's smoking hot. Just in case you guys thought I'd shout that out. Um, mashallah, I actually consulted with a few submitters about something. I, I, got, I, I didn't get very far into my chronological timeline of Moses' life until I realized there was this piece that didn't seem very obvious to me about where it fit. And that was the... The, the experience he had with his guiding teacher, the angel. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was pretty interesting. But um, so this is, again, everything in here is, this is my understanding. If the chronological order is not correct. Please don't, uh, please don't get upset with me. But um, Moses and his teacher, from my understanding, because of the verse, and it talks about how he has a servant. We all know Moses grew up uh, as a prince. And so... Um, this, this story starts with his life and his guiding teacher. Let me read some of these verses. The valuable lessons from Moses and his teacher. Moses said to his servant, I will not rest until I reach the point where the two rivers meet, no matter how long it takes. When they reached the point where they met, they forgot their fish, and it found its way back to the river sneakily. After they passed that point, he said to his servant, let us have lunch. All this traveling has thoroughly exhausted us. He said, remember when we sat by the rock back there, I paid no attention to the fish. It was the devil who made me forget it, and it found its way back to the river strangely. Now, how many people here forget things? This better be everybody here, please. Um, lesson number one. <laughs> when we forget something... It's, uh, it's the devil. The devil caused us to forget it. So very interesting lesson. This also shows us that at this point in Moses' life, he already knew God. And 28.14 says, when he reached maturity and strength, we endowed him with wisdom and knowledge. Thank you, Firuza. We thus reward the righteous. So he had already, when he reached uh, maturity and strength, God endowed him with, with wisdom at this point. They found one of our servants whom we blessed with mercy and bestowed upon him from our knowledge. Moses said to him, can I follow you? That you may teach me some of the knowledge and the guidance bestowed upon you. He said, you cannot stand to be with me. He said, how can you stand that which you do not comprehend? He said, you will find me, God willing, patient. I will not disobey any command you give me. I'm going to have to skip forward here. So, the whole purpose of, and we all know the story and, and the things that he observes, and he objects to every one of them. The whole purpose of this story and this teaching purpose, this purpose of his is that there's a good reason for everything. And that was important for him. And we're going to see this later on in his life and, and as he goes through his trials and tribulations. He needed to understand that just because he didn't understand something right at that moment, that there's a much, much bigger picture, and, and we can also learn from this too. So he explained to them the things that went on, and um, we all know how that goes. So we're going we're gonna to fast forward here to Moses kills. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
I, I put this together, guys, because I want some sort of a slideshow and an animation. I was feeling very uh, left out with everybody's slides. Um, it, it's very hard to find accurate depictions. So <laughs> these are not endorsed by me. Um, but anyway, um, here, here's uh, his fellow uh, Israelite getting beaten by what I imagine to be a, uh, an Egyptian guard. And there he is there with uh, a knife in his hand. We know that's not what happened. So um, <laughs> now, I've, for those of you that know me, know my past, um, you know, I've, I've punched a lot of people in my life. I've hit a lot of people really hard in the face. I've knocked many of them out. And I have never, ever, I can't even imagine possessing the strength to kill somebody with one punch. Um, in fact, um, I tried to do some research to see if there was anything in boxing or MMA and uh, anything of this actually existing, and there isn't. Uh, most of the time that people, when they die, if they get hit, it's because they hit their head falling on something. Um, but, and, and there have been boxers and people that have died, but it's because they got hit four or 500 times in one night. So that's a lot of strength to be able to kill somebody. After he, um, he, um, he commits this, he says, My Lord, I have wronged my soul. Please forgive me. And God forgave him. He is the forgiver most merciful. He said, My Lord, in return for your blessings upon me, I will never be a supporter of the guilty ones. So repent. He's here making the firm repentance to reform. Now in the morning... He was in the city, afraid and watchful. The one who sought his help the day before asked for his help again. Moses said to him, you are really a troublemaker. Then it says, Moses' crime exposed. Before he attempted to strike their common enemy, so Moses clearly had a temper problem, right? He said, oh Moses, do you want to kill me as you killed the other man yesterday? Obviously, you wish to be a tyrant on earth. You do not wish to be righteous. The man came running from the other side of the city saying, Oh Moses, the people are plotting to kill you. You better leave immediately. I'm giving you good advice. He fled the city, afraid and watchful. He said, My Lord, save me from the oppressive people. So Moses flees to Midian. Oh. As he traveled towards Midian, he said, May my Lord guide me in the right path. When he reached Midian's water, he found a crowd of people watering and noticed two women waiting on the side. He said, what is it that you need? They said, we were not able to water until the crowd disperses and our father is an old man. Now, we know what Shariar would have done in this situation from his Friday sermon, um, but he, he obviously used his strength and his size and went up to the front of the line. I would imagine the women that asked him for his help uh, caught his eye in some way, and he went in there and got them some water. <laughs> it's the layman version of it. So he watered for them, turned to the shade, saying, My Lord, whatever provision you send me, I, I have a feeling he had one in mind, I am in dire need for it. Soon one of the two women approached him shyly and said, My father invites you to pay, invites to pay you for watering for us when he met him. He told him his story, he said, Have no fear. You've been saved from the oppressive people. This is an interesting moment. This is the first time Moses is, is explaining what happened to him and reveals his identity to the people of Midian. Now, he's a fugitive of Egypt at this point, right? So um, not an easy task to go through. Um, we know he goes, uh, he, he ends up getting married. The important part here is Moses stays here for roughly eight to nine years, raises a family, that's a long time, and I want to pause here for a minute and talk about timing. Um, that's a bad sign when you're... This is a lot of time that's gone by from all these events. And when you think about from beginning to end, and even just from the point where he comes out of Midian, 
This has been a good chunk of his life, that the polishing and the, the growing of the soul and the learning from the lessons, and we don't have a lot of detail from those eight or nine years in Midian, um, but I would imagine raising a family and you know, going through all the stuff that believers and submitters go through. When he fulfilled his obligation, he traveled with his family toward Egypt. He saw from the slope of Mount Sinai a fire. He said to his family, stay here. I've seen a fire. Maybe I can bring to you news or a portion of the fire to warm you. When he reached it, he was called from the edge of the right side of the valley in the blessed spot where the burning bush was located. Oh, Moses, this is me, God, Lord of the universe. Now, this is very profound. Um, God is speaking to a human being directly here, and this is the only human being he's ever spoke to directly. And um, it, it's, it's, um, try to imagine being Moses and God speaking to you from a burning bush. He says, throw down your staff. When he saw it moving like a demon, he turned around and fled. So, you know, he, he turned around and ran for his life, Right? God saying, oh, Moses, come back. Do not be afraid. You are perfectly safe. And then he says, pick it up. Do not be afraid. We will return it to its original state. So I personally don't have an issue with snakes, but have you ever met somebody that has an issue with snakes? And I would imagine back then, not too many people kept snakes as pets, right? That's kind of a new thing, a new generation thing. Um, you, you just reaching down and grabbing a snake with your bare hands is, is not something people did all the time. He said, put your hand into your pocket. It will come out white without a blemish. Fold your wings. Settle down from your fear. These are two proofs from your Lord to be shown to Pharaoh and his elders. They have been wicked people. Go to Pharaoh, for he has transgressed. So this is where he receives the commandment from God to go to Pharaoh. Now, this is a very important, uh, another, another pinnacle part of his life here, where he's being told to go and face the most powerful, tyrannical person on earth that wants to kill him. And most people would consider that a suicide mission, okay? So try to understand the gravity of these matters that Moses went through. We don't go through this every day. God has not asked anywhere near of us, uh, near that of us. He said, my Lord, I killed one of them, and I fear lest they kill me. He said, my Lord, cool my temper and make this matter easy for me. So I think it was interesting. The first thing he's worried about is his temper, right? That's... I would have thought of a lot of other things before that. And untie a knot from my tongue so that they can understand my speech and appoint an assistant from me, from my family, my brother Aaron, strengthen me with him. Let him be my partner in this matter that we may glorify you frequently. So let's stop right here. This is, this is amazing and profound. He's asking God to appoint his brother not to just strengthen him, but so that together, and while they're together, they can glorify God frequently and commemorate him frequently. This is how we stay steadfast, constantly reminding ourselves about God. When you're, when you're facing adversity and peril, the adversity and peril is part of this life. It's part of the illusion of this life. If you truly believe none of this is actually happening or matters, then you wouldn't need that security. Right? But so what does God tell us to do? Constantly think of God. Commemorate him frequently. Remember why and how and understand God's system to give you strength. He said, your request is granted, O Moses. He said, we will strengthen you with your brother and we will provide you both with manifest authority. Manifest authority, if you guys don't know what that means, it means Obvious, unmistakable authority. So he's telling these guys, You're, don't worry. Thus, they will not be able to touch either one of you. So I'm going to send you in 
to the most dangerous place on earth, and they won't be able to touch you, and you're going to have manifest authority. With our miracles, the two of you together, with those who follow you, will be the victors. This is another key point. He gives him a little slice of the future. He says, you'll be victorious. At this point, Moses doesn't know how. He doesn't say you're going to lead the children out of Israel. He doesn't say you're going to cross the Red Sea. He says, don't worry, you're going to be victorious with the miracles. So Moses from here is sent to Pharaoh. After those messengers, we sent Moses with our signs to Pharaoh and his people, but they transgressed. Note the consequences for the wicked. Moses said, O Pharaoh, I'm a messenger from the Lord of the universe. It is incumbent upon me that I do not say anything about God except the truth. I come to you with a sign from your Lord. Let the children of Israel go. So he's a fugitive. He shows up to the most dangerous guy on earth and makes a demand that he loses his entire workforce overnight and that his economy crashes. It's just a little tiny little favor he's asking, right? So Pharaoh says, if you have a sign, then produce it if you're truthful. He threw down his staff and it turned into a tremendous serpent. He took out his hand, and it was white to the beholders, the two miracles God told them to go do. The leaders among Pharaoh's people said, this is no more than a clever magician. He wants to take you out of your land. What do you recommend? So now, you know, everything I've just said, so now he's standing in front of this guy, makes those demands, then humiliates him, okay, in front of his elders and his staff. Completely humiliates the guy. Pharaoh said, O oh, you elders, I have not known of any god for you other than me. Therefore, fire the adobe, O oh, Haman, in order to build a tower that I may look at the god of Moses. I'm sure that he is a liar. This is one of the dumbest statements I've ever read from an idol worshiper in the Quran. So uh, has anybody here ever climbed up a mountain to look at stars? Did the stars look any bigger to you? They don't. They don't change. And so this guy thinks he's going to climb a ladder and see what he can't see from the ground. So there's a huge sign of ignorance right there, right? They said, respite him and his brother. Now imagine this. He rolls in, he makes these amazing claims, humiliates him, and then God is controlling the minds of his elders to say, <laughs> give him some time. Right? Don't chop his head off. Just give him some time. And send summoners to every city. This is where God came in and played um, Pharaoh's ego and arrogance against himself. So Pharaoh wanted to prove him wrong instead of just terminating the matter right there. Right? And this was all part of God's plan. Let them summon every experienced magician. The magicians came to Pharaoh and said, do we get paid if we are the winners? Yes, you will be close to me. Moses humiliates Pharaoh with his miracles. Oh, here's Pharaoh getting mad. Damn it. How dare you? Get out of here. You know, whatever he's saying here. Oh. So we know what happens. He throws the staff down, and, and the truth is recognized by the experts. They were defeated. They were humiliated. Okay? So... Again, I mean, you could, not, you could not ask for a better story of, of someone showing up with God on his side and accomplishing a humiliation of the most powerful tyrant on earth in this moment. No army, no nothing. Him and his brother. It's unheard of. So Pharaoh turns around, um, the leaders among pe Pharaoh's people said, we will, we, will you allow Moses and his people to corrupt the earth and forsake you and your gods? Okay. 
Your handwriting is horrible. <laughs> we will kill their sons and spare their daughters. We are much more powerful than they. But, this is what Paul is saying, right? But God establishes the truth with his words despite the criminals. Okay? None believed with Moses except a few of his people. So now let's look at the perspective of the children of Israel hearing about all this. Okay? They, they, they're terrified. This guy comes back, thoroughly humiliates, antagonizes, I mean, every insulting thing you could do to the person who is persecuting the children of Israel. And do you think they were clapping and cheering? They were not. They were afraid that, Mo that Pharaoh was going to take it out on them again. None believed with Moses except a few of his people while fearing the tyranny of Pharaoh and his elders. Surely Pharaoh was much too arrogant on earth, a real tyrant. Moses said, O oh my people, if you have really believed in God, then put your trust in him if you are really submitters. So this is, this is kind of enter in first test for the children of Israel here at the time of Moses, right? This is their first point in time. Now, all these miracles that, that, that Moses performed for Pharaoh, they also witnessed. Moses said to his people, seek God's help and steadfastly persevere. The earth belongs to God, not Pharaoh, right? And he grants it to whomever he chooses from among his servants. The ultimate victory belongs to the righteous, not the tyrannical. They said, we were persecuted before you came to us and after you came to us. He said, your Lord will annihilate your enemy and establish you on earth then see how you will behave. So they're given a slice of the future here as well. They said, we trust in God, our Lord, save us from the persecution of these oppressive people. But you can see, this is this, the, the kind of stuff you're, we're going to see as we go forward here. You know, they're arguing and arguing and arguing, and they finally said, okay, we believe. But they, they didn't do it right off the bat, right? Deliver us with your mercy from the disbelieving people. We inspired Moses and his brother, maintain your homes in Egypt for the time being. Turn your homes into synagogues and maintain the contact prayer salat. Give good news to the believers. The reason for this is so that they could, st they could stay there and witness the plagues and the retribution happening to Pharaoh and his people. So I've got here, now comes the pain, right? So... Anytime you do this, this happens. So what's that? You got a locust in your eye, buddy? You sure do. So here's the pain. We then afflicted Pharaoh's people with drought, shortage of crops that they may take heed. Consequently, we sent upon them the flood, the locust, the lice. There's, there's actually no real like shot you can get of lice. I don't know if you guys, anyway, they're really tiny. This next one's disgusting for those of you that don't like lice, close your eyes, but this is what happens when it just takes over your head. So you can imagine the retribution. Yeah, and by the way, they didn't have lice shampoo back then, okay? So let's kind of gravitate towards the magnitude of that retribution on that scale. These guys probably had to shave themselves, everybody, men, women, and children. Um, there was no Walgreens back then. Here are the frogs. They're probably not so cute when there's billion of them, right? And loud. So uh, I don't know how many people here know, but uh, I drain my pool and just kind of let it go because we're thinking of redoing it. And it turned into a frog pond. And um, it turned into a symphony of frogs. And we have double pane windows and doors, and at night it drives Char crazy because it is loud. And I got to tell you, maybe there's 15 frogs. <laughs> maybe, maybe 15 frogs. So again, while I was going through this, a lot of this was just really, when you think about the magnitude of these things, billions of frogs in one city, 
Um, what, what an amazing miracle, right? Here's the blood. It's not a real picture, that's a cartoon. So let's talk about the exodus from Egypt. Um, believe it or not, there, there, nobody knows anything, okay? So um, <laughs> you can Google where did Moses cross the rest Red Sea, and I'm surprised somebody didn't put it, have him crossing the Atlantic Ocean, to be honest with you. That was the only thing that wasn't there. But um, this one seemed to be the most amusing. Um, anyway, there's some... Uh, physical evidence here of, um, at this part um, of, of the Gulf of Aqaba. It's very deep here, it's very deep here, and it's only about 40 meters here. Um, and, and it's pretty interesting, and it's, 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 it's not that wide either. It's like a five, six lane, seven lane freeway. And, um, and anyway, they think that's, that's where, but it makes sense, Midian and Sinai are over there, so. Um, so they, they traveled a long way. I could not find a mileage for this, but random stuff has said days, five miles, Hossein? Yeah, five miles. Apparently Hossein's is five miles. That's five miles. I think he's telling me five minutes, but, um, anyway, long way, long way they were pursued by Pharaoh and their troops. And it says, Pharaoh and his troops pursued them aggressively and sinfully. They pursued them toward the east. So that's going in the right direction, right? Um, here we have one of the most profound miracles um, in history. And we happen to have Google satellite image of the whole thing. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Apparently Google was even around back then. But uh, I would imagine if Google was and there was a satellite image, it might have looked something like this. Um, here's Pharaoh's troops. You know, I, I looked at this and tried to proportionally come up with something that was reasonable. In the Quran, it says it was um, on either side two great hills. And, you know, so it, it, it wasn't hundreds, thousands of feet. Um, it, it had to be reasonable, right? Like Noah's Ark wasn't holding every animal on the planet. So this looks relatively reasonable to me. That may be something uh, that, that they could have saw, but unbelievable, right, the, this type of miracle to see. When the parties saw each other, Moses' people said, we will be caught. Sharia brought this up the other day. Moses said, no way. How, how often when we're put into a situation do we just say, no way? We need to. My Lord is with me. He will guide me. And then this happened. We thus saved Moses and all those who were with him, and we drowned the others. This should be sufficient proof that most people are not believers. That's supposed to be Pharaoh's people drowning. And they're all saved. Okay. So children of Israel are safe. Now, now this, is, this, is, this is profound here. After all the miracles, we delivered the children of Israel across the sea. So after witnessing this, when they passed by people who were worshiping statues, they said, oh, Moses, make a god for us like they have. Can you imagine the patience this guy must have had to have? Okay. Un, I mean, Unbelievable. He did say to them, indeed, you are ignorant people. He said, these people are committing a blasphemy for what they're doing. It is disastrous for them. Shall I seek for you other than God to be your God when he has blessed you more than anyone else in the world? Man, these guys really didn't get it, right? Recall that we delivered from you... Uh, we delivered you from Pharaoh's people, inflicted the worst persecution upon you, killing your sons, sparing your daughters. That was an exacting trial. We gave Moses the scripture after having annihilated the previous generations and after setting the examples through them to provide an enlightenment for the people and guidance and mercy. So I'm assuming at this point they come across the, the heifer. Um, 
And we know the story of the heifer. I should probably just skip that. But, um, you know, Moses said sacrifice a cow. Apparently, they're really into these livestock and cows, and maybe they just didn't want to do it. But they didn't do it. They were hesitant again and again and again, and they finally did it. We summoned Moses for 30 nights and completed them by adding 10. So Moses goes, and he comes to our appointed time, and his Lord spoke, said, my Lord, let me look and see you. This is the second time he's talking to God now. He said, you cannot see me. Look at that mountain. If it stays in its place, then you can see me. Then his Lord manifested himself to the mountain, and this caused it to crumble. Moses fell unconscious. When he came to, he said, be you glorified. I repent to you, and I am the most convinced believer. So he needed a little reassurance at this point still. He said, oh, Moses, I've chosen you out of all the people with my message and by speaking to you. Therefore, take what I have given you and be appreciative. We wrote for him on the tablets all kinds of enlightenments and details of everything. You shall uphold these teachings strongly and exhort your people to uphold them. So he goes back to his people. And they said, why did you rush away from your people, O Moses? He said, they are close behind me. I've rushed to you, my Lord, that you may be pleased. He said, we have put your people to the test after you left, but the Sumerian misled them. So here he's coming back. Moses returned to his people. Here's the, uh, here's the calf. Um, I'm assuming that idol-worshipping pansy over there is the Sumerian. I'm not sure, but looks like he's the one that had the idea, right? And Makan, look, he's a redhead. Where's Makan? <laughs> Makan's theory is correct. They were all redheads. So Moses gets there, and he's upset. This is, um, this is actually a pretty um, important part here for us, especially what we're talking about. In, uh, in submission. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up on this point because I think it's really important. Um, Moses said to his brother Aaron, what is it that prevented you when you saw them go astray? He said, oh, son of my mother, do not pull me by my beard and my head. I was afraid that you might say you have divided the children of Israel and disobeyed my orders. He said, what is the matter with you, O Samarian? You know, and starts talking about the Sumerian here. This is a profound scenario here where Moses is telling his brother, and we get from this that, you know, compromising our religion and standing aside in fear of division is not correct. This is not a correct behavior. And another thing to think about is the other side of division or divide is ally, okay? God commands the believers to not ally themselves with the disbelievers. Dividers will divide, hypocrites will drop out, but we have a certain duty as well. And clearly was wrong what Aaron did. And Moses let him know that. Finally, when they regretted their action, they realized they had gone astray. They said, unless our Lord redeems us with his mercy and forgives us, we will be the losers. Moses said, my Lord, forgive me and my brother and admit us into your mercy of all the merciful ones. You are the most merciful. So, um, you know, there's more. You guys know what the, the rest of the story and how it ends up. Um, he ends up parting from, the, the, from the, uh, the Israelites, which is probably why they never ended up worshiping him because he left them. And, um, you, you know, left them in the desert. So they're, they're not very fond of them. But anyway, um, that's, that's the, kind of the gist of it and, and the most important part. I think when, when you look at how it's relevant and everything that Moses went through to purify himself and, and that, that pinnacle moment where, you know, his brother was not standing for the truth and he kind of stood aside and he was afraid. Um, it's really important that we don't we don't do that anyway. Thank you guys. Sorry it took so long.
Jones.